Are synthetic substances more or less dangerous than the drugs we see out on the streets? Will we see powdered alcohol here in Texas soon? And as they discuss it in the legislature in Austin, are they really talking about banning alcohol simply because it comes in the form of a powder and not a liquid? Good evening and welcome to HCCLA's Reasonable Doubt. My name is Carmen Rowe and I'm the president of HCCLA, the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. We're the largest local criminal defense bar in the country. And tonight we're going to talk about drugs in Houston, the laws that impact those drugs, and discussions that are happening right now in Austin in our Texas legislature. With our special guest, criminal defense attorney Chris Downing, as well as Houston Normal Executive Director Jason Miller. With our host, Jimmy Ardwan and Damon Parrish. Thank you, Carmen. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another episode of HCCLA's Reasonable Doubt. I'm Jimmy Ardwan, along with my co-host, Damon Parrish, and it's good to be back this week after a little bit of a break for me. And as Carmen said, we're going to have Defense Attorney Chris Downey on tonight and the Executive Director of Houston Normal, Jason Miller, with us, and we're glad to have them both on the show. Damon Parrish, I want to bring you in. How are you doing? Good. How are Welcome you? Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. First off, I would think we owe a big congratulations. Some some breaking news today. Hannah Overton, uh, who was charged back in 2007 with poisoning her foster son, she was a, exonerated today. I guess the charges were dismissed. And so I uh, just want to give a congratulations out to a prior guest of ours, John Raley, and his legal team with Jerry Goldstein and the other lawyers for a job well done. That's right. That's right. And. Um, Hopefully we'll have John back on the show to talk about that and we can get the full details of everything, assuming the gag order's been lifted. <laughs> He's free to talk about it. And in a waterproof details. table. Exactly, in a waterproof table. Uh, second item I want to turn to, this has not been a good week for another bad week for law enforcement. Uh, the big story, of course, is a South Carolina officer uh, charged with murder now. And he, I mean, this is one of the most egregious things I've ever seen, Damon. Right. He shoots a 50-year-old black man, white officer, uh, shoots a 50-year-old black man in the back as he's, and I wouldn't even classify it as running, jogging uh, away from him. Uh, the dispute started allegedly over a broken taillight was how he got pulled over. Uh, there have been innuendos about perhaps some unpaid child support that that caused the flight. But the big thing, I think, is the fact that we actually have a cell phone video, and that cell phone video does not match up with what the officer's report said. Surprise, surprise, right? Yeah, big shock. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, so as you mentioned, South Carolina, uh, what we do know is that he, uh, the gentleman, uh, Mr. Scott, was not pulled over for a violent offense. It wasn't rape, murder, aggravated murder, anything like that. He didn't have a weapon on him either. Uh, according to the officer, he tried to steal his taser gun. But I think if you watch the video, and at this point in time, if you have not seen the video, where have you been, you can see the officer discard something. Now, we don't know what it is, but we see him discard something after he has shot uh, Walter Scott in the back eight times, eight times while fleeing from him. And I think, as you mentioned also, uh, Walter Scott's flee from him wasn't epic. We're not talking about uh, Usain Bolt here. We're talking about a guy who barely made it 10 feet in, in a minute. You know, also could have got him really fast, could have tackled him, could have used any number of non-lethal means and instead opted almost immediately from the time Walter Scott turned around, the officer decided, I'm going to shoot this guy. Uh, I think it's egregious, and I think it's, it's very, a very sad state for us. And I think it's amazing that it's on camera and that we can actually see you know, what, we've what we've been talking about for years. Yeah, I agree, and I, I'm, I'm interested to watch how this unfolds because I honestly don't believe that if we, if, we had, if we didn't have that cell phone video, I don't think this guy would be charged at all. I really mm -hmm. don't. I think it would have been washed under the, the table, and we would never hear another thing about it. They might have some disciplinary hearing. We might hear a little bit about it on the news, but the truth wouldn't have come to light. So, it wouldn't have. you know, thank God for the cell phone video. And what's, uh, what's further scarier about that is that we don't know what else the officer has done. I mean, but for this video and the ease at which he did his actions, we can believe that he's done more stuff. Maybe not as to this step, but other things. And so we don't know where else this officer has laid a, a taint upon uh, the profession. Very true, very true. Well, we'll keep an eye on this one and hopefully get to talk about uh, the proceedings in some of our future episodes. But right now, I want to bring in our guest this evening, Defense Attorney Chris Downey and the Executive Director of Houston Normal, Jason Miller. Gentlemen, welcome to the program tonight. Thank you for joining us. Thanks Appreciate for it a bunch. Um, we're going to talk about drug enforcement laws here tonight, as Carmen alluded to in, the, in our opening. And, and Jason, since you're here, I want to start with you because we kind of have some, some current events here in Texas going on. Last night we had a debate 
in Austin in the, in the legislature about House Bill 507. And that bill is seeking to decriminalize uh, possession of less than an ounce of marijuana in Texas. And this is really, there have been other bills that have, uh, have kind of sought similar things, but this one is really getting the most push because it's, it's got the support of the Texas Young Republicans, it's got the support of many people in the House, and what it's seeking to do, as I understand it, is not make it a criminal uh, offense, but rather drop it to a civil crime to be in possession of an ounce or less of marijuana and basically make it a fine. Am I understanding that right? That's correct. It would change it to a civil penalty as opposed to uh, a criminal misdemeanor. So anything under an ounce or less would be a civil fine of no more than $100. And that's how the bill was uh, initially written um, by Representative Moody. And there was, in the hearing last night, this was before the Criminal Jurisprudence Committee in the House. And there was actually four bills that were being heard um, at the same time in the testimony. And it went on until about 2 in the morning. Um, the four bills were basically decriminalization of marijuana, but to different levels. So the lowest level would be uh, Representative Wu. Uh, his bill would make anything under 0.35 ounces a Class C misdemeanor. So it, it creates a new Class C for, for a 0.35 ounce or less. Um, and there was also the, the next step up would have been the uh, decriminalization bill from a Representative Dutton, which makes anything under an ounce or less a Class C misdemeanor. And then there's House Bill 507, uh, which has a very strong push behind it right now. And, and like we said, that makes it a, a civil fine. So it's not a criminal misdemeanor at all. It's just a civil fine. Now, there was a, a committee substitute um, that was put in place for that bill. And I believe what it does is changes it to a $250 fine instead of 100 And then there's a few other things. It, it didn't get discussed in detail as far as the committee substitute. But um, the bill that uh, a lot of people are, are re really what's being debated uh, for the most part, is House Bill 2165, and that's Representative David Simpson's bill that repeals marijuana prohibition altogether. It removes any mention of it from uh, Texas criminal statutes, and there was also um, some committee substitutes for that bill as well, um, things like uh, age restrictions and some of the restrictions on sales and things like that to minors. Uh, so th those, those were, he read those off. Um, I, I really feel that with these bills, a Representative David Simpson's bill is the right way to go um, as far as the problems that we see. And the reason why is because it's the only piece of legislation that would actually completely curb the black market, the uh, black market marijuana trade that we see in, in Texas and across the United States. And I think in Texas that is so important because of our, our border and uh, because of some of the you know drug um, violence and cartel violence that we see here in Texas. So a lot of people are really excited about that. Uh, a lot of people testified in favor, and the only people testifying against, it was only a handful, uh, maybe uh, five to ten people testifying against uh, marijuana decriminalization, and they were all against 2165. So they're actually, I did not really hear any testimony against House Bill 507. Hmm. Well, let me ask you a question, Jason, uh, and, that, and for Chris as well. For House Bill 507, you said it's decriminalized at portions of it, and it's now civil. So does that mean it carries the conviction as well? If a person is stopped, what happens with uh, under ounce of marijuana? Under House Bill 07, what happens to them? Well, it's still illegal uh, to, to possess marijuana. Um, it's just not a it's just not a, a criminal offense. It's a civil penalty. So there would be no criminal record involved. There would be no jail time, and um, there would be no uh, arrest or, or conviction. So what we're going to see from that is is really the step that that, that would take it would be a very good step because it eliminates um, the problem that we see with with young people and lower income communities and things like that with all the arrests and the prosecution. They have trouble getting jobs. They have trouble um, getting student loans things like that. So that's really the goal of that is to keep people out of jail, keep people from having a criminal record, but at the same time, you know, people can still be searched the same way. Um, and they can still, you know, have the marijuana confiscated. They can either pay the fine or when they go to court, they could have the option to, you know, do community service or a drug education course to, you know, instead of the, the, the fine, to avoid the fine. Sure. And Chris, <laughs> let me ask you a question. With uh, House Bill 507, if it is passed, Say I'm driving and I have under ounce of marijuana in my car, but I also have a gun. Do you believe I will still be charged with possession uh, of a firearm, illegal possession of a firearm, or unlawful possession of a firearm, since I have a companion uh, marijuana, even though it's been decriminalized? I think it's highly probable that you would be. 
uh, I also think that although it is a, a first step in the right direction, it, it's st there are still some attendant laws that, that are still triggered. For example, delivery. Uh, of, uh, of an ounce of marijuana or less uh, does, does not uh, become decriminalized. And, and right now it's, it's a felony. Uh, it's a state jail felony to deliver a, uh, an ounce of marijuana. And so here you have a law that says it's decriminalizing uh, a possession of less than an ounce, but still criminalizing the delivery of that less than an ounce. It's a step in the right direction. I think that, that uh, it, it, it's, it's a, a movement uh, toward the sensible uh, approach to marijuana in Texas, uh, but it, it, we've still got an awfully long right. way to go. Absolutely. Chris, I want to ask you about, you were a former Harris County District Attorney once upon a time, and the DA's office here has kind of made a, a push to institute what they call the First Chance Program with regard to first-time offenders in, in marijuana cases. Tell us a little bit about that program and how that's working from what you've seen. Sure. The, the standard operating procedure for a lot of criminal defense lawyers who are faced with representing people charged with um, small amounts of marijuana is to apply for pretrial diversion. Pretrial diversion is a, simply a diversionary program, a contract between the defendant and the and the, the, the government uh, that they will dismiss the case after you perform certain acts like community service. Uh, what uh, uh, Devin Anderson's office has done is formalize that into a program. Uh, and it cuts down on the need to apply for pretrial diversion, but it accomplishes the same purpose. You do some community service, take some educational classes, you stay out of trouble, and, and the matter goes away. It, looking at it globally and looking at it from a policy standpoint, the bottom line is nobody wants these laws enforced. Uh, they just don't. I mean, if you look at it, the law's on the books and the DA has set up a diversionary program. Uh, I think uh, that speaks volumes about whether or not we want our, our resources, our police resources and our, our probation resources spent on, on these small amounts of drugs. And, and one question I have for both of you and, and to find out if there was some debate about this very issue is we have these threshold amounts. So for instance, 507 puts it at um, you know one ounce or less. I, I can't remember exactly what the first chance program's cutoff is, uh, but you know you have these these small amounts, these personal use amounts that are cut off for either the new civil penalty or uh, you know making it a class C or entry into the first chance program. How are police officers expected to determine this for purposes of whether or not they put the cuffs on somebody or not? I can only say this. Um, you know, a police officer always has the discretion to make arrests. I have come into contact with officers and have listened to interviews with officers where they will say, I don't make arrests for those small amounts of marijuana. I think that these policies that are in place uh, make that decision perhaps a little bit easier for the street officer to say, I'm not going to arrest the guy for less than an ounce or two of, of marijuana because the, the, they're going to end up in the diversionary program. So how does it impact it? I, I think that it increases the possibility that the street officer doesn't arrest. Um, I don't, I can't speak with any authority about how the police union feels about the decriminalization of small amounts of marijuana. I imagine that they're opposed to it. And they're opposed to it because they use those, that, that entry level crime uh, to do other things, to, uh, to search more thoroughly, to, uh, to get permission to search your house, uh, and things of that nature. Yeah. I mean, was there any discussion last night, Jason, about what, what kind of power is vested in the officer? I mean, if, if the cutoff is, is one ounce, what if we have a situation where it's 1.1 ounces? I mean, how, how is right. the officer going to determine that for purposes of whether or not to put somebody in cuffs or to just slap them with a civil fine? Well, I believe the officer wouldn't necessarily have to determine that. I think the officer would still have the discretion to, to make an arrest if they, if they feel a need to do that. Um, what the bills are really, you know, that have that threshold amount that you're talking about. What the goal of that is, is to eliminate, completely eliminate situations where somebody has like a joint or um, a, a real small amount like that, a, a small usable amount for, you know, people getting together to, to smoke a little bit. Um, that's really what it's, it's aimed toward because most of the cases are, are those very small amounts. So it, it creates a, a, a threshold, but it is kind of arbitrary being, you know, a certain number, whether it's 0.35 ounces or, or one ounce or two ounces or four ounces. And this is something that, that David Simpson talked about and why his bill 
um, just repeals prohibition entirely because, you know, you can't really just decriminalize the possession. You know, you've got to have the, the sale, the, the growing and everything like that. And the way that he puts it, and it's very interesting because he's, he's very much changed the discussion about this entirely, the discussion that we're having um, amongst the lawmakers and the constituents and, and the people in general, is he basically said um, in testimony, you know, God did not make us slaves or robots. God made us free and responsible individuals. And civil government should punish the wrongdoer when they harm their neighbor. But other than that, we ought to leave people alone. And that's, you know, a very powerful message that, that, that's really resonating. And I think it's, um, something's going to, something's going to pass, you know, whether it's, which is just depends on which step or are we willing to take at this point. And I think Texas really should take a, a very bold position like that and, you know, be an example for the rest of the country. Well, Jason, uh, under either bill, uh, 507 or Mr. Simpson's bill, is, would, it be allow, would it be allowed then for you to use marijuana in public, or is this only for private consumption in your car, in your, person, in your, your own home? It would be in, in your own personal home. You know, the, uh, public consumption, there's still going to be laws against that. Um, you know, th there's going to be stipulations like that that come into it. And then through the amendment process as well, as it moves through the House uh, or moves through the Senate, there would be amendments that would um, bring things like that into the bill that, uh, you know, may not necessarily have been put in initially, but there would be things like, you know, there's already a you know, the, the committee uh, changes that have been made to it and, and more changes would, would be made to, to that. Um, but it wouldn't change laws against anything else as far as, you know, driving while intoxicated is still illegal, you know, regardless of which drug you're, you're intoxicated by. That's still illegal. That doesn't change. Um, sale to minors, you know, it's st still be illegal. So uh, things like that. It, it, it goes through a, a process where it, it all comes in and uh, becomes a very comprehensive uh, piece of legislation. Now, Chris, we've already seen a handful of states and the District of Columbia legalize marijuana uh, to, to some degree. Um, and it seems to have come into a great conflict with the federal laws. And I know you do a lot of federal work. And uh, recently there was a challenge out in California that somebody made under a due process argument that he was being unfairly treated and prosecuted in California for, uh, for marijuana crimes when the federal government was not invoking those same laws against people in other states and jurisdictions. Given that, and given now that we're kind of seeing a trend, um, what, what do you think the, the future holds for marijuana prosecutions, not just at the state level, but at the federal level as well? Well, I think if there's going to be any, uh, one of the things that all uh, of the federal circuits and, uh, and, and uh, jurisprudence uh, strives for is continuity and and across all measures and states and there's absolutely no doubt that in in the issue of marijuana uh, there is very selective prosecution going on in the various circuits and i think if if there were ever to be a true ground shift in how states view marijuana and how this country views marijuana, it has to occur at the federal level. If the federal government ever uh, stepped out in front of this and said, uh, we're going to change the way we approach our marijuana prosecutions, it would, uh, dr it would dramatically affect uh, the state legislatures. Now, I saw an article yesterday in Fortune magazine about how all this has affected the cartels dramatically, and they've seen a just a, a huge decrease in their marijuana revenues. And uh, you and I were talking before the show, Chris, about how you think that a lot of the money that the cartels have made and the, and the loss from here, they're funneling that into other efforts. Oh, absolutely. What, what kind of efforts do you think they're funneling that into now? I have very little doubt that cartels are focusing on the production of methamphetamine in remarkably pure uh, formats. Uh, that is a substance that is very difficult uh, to uh, produce in, in the United States, uh, but is much easier to produce in other countries. I have no doubt that, uh, that uh, cartels are interested in developing uh, compounding uh, businesses that produce uh, pills, uh, illicit forms of hydrocodone that don't make it into the uh, uh, traditional pharmacy pipeline. Uh, I have no doubt uh, that they are, are working uh, diligently on trying to move heroin. Now, we've seen, I mean, and, and I say we, most of us who practice in the federal system, for the most part, we've seen a decline in the 
last 10 years or so of the huge cartel cases where people were moving pounds of weed, pounds of cocaine, pounds of meth at a time. It, 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 we've seen a decline in those kind of prosecutions. They seem, they seem to be moving in much smaller numbers. Is it because the, the, the war on drugs, so to speak, has somewhat worked, or is it that the cartel has gotten smarter about how they move drugs into this country? I think the only true measure of whether or not the war on drugs is working is the street price of the substance. During the cartel wars, we saw a dramatic spike in the price of a kilo of cocaine, for example. A kilo of cocaine went from about $16,000 to about $25,000 and up on the streets of Houston. Uh, that price has now come down. Additionally, uh, I, I think you'd find that the cost of heroin uh, is, is low, the cost of methamphetamines is fairly low, and the cost of pills has come down. And uh, that leads me to conclude and believe uh, that interdiction efforts against uh, cartels are, are somewhat in ineffective, or at least that the flow of drugs across the border is substantial. Oh, Jason, I want to piggyback off Jimmy's question. We know that rec recreational use of marijuana in California, uh, Colorado is legal. How, have, how has Colorado itself been affected by the recreational use of marijuana being legalized? Well, there was a lot of that discussed in the testimony, um, you know, in the hearing uh, the other night. And there was some very, very good testimony. And, and I'm just it was so impressed with um, all of our friends that, that came out and gave that <clears throat> gave that testimony. And there was some, you know, uh, some Houstonians that, that participated, um, uh, including, you know, Dr. William Martin with uh, Rice University's Baker Institute. Um, Dr. Catherine Neal, also with the Baker Institute, um, Kim Og testified in favor of House Bill 507 and talked about the cost of prosecution. And um, th th a lot of those issues were addressed as far as uh, comparing, you know, decriminalization efforts in other states and how uh, teen use has been affected, you know, before and after decriminalization uh, and how it's compared to, you know, one state to the other. And what we see, what the consensus is with that, and this is what all the data shows, this is what, what all the numbers show, is that uh, decriminalizing or, or even legalizing, it doesn't call, cause the sky to, to fall, you know, after it happens. We, in Colorado, everything's just fine there, you know. It's, um, it's not something where we're, we're seeing problems. Crime is not increasing. Uh, use among teens is not increasing. So we're seeing that from the data that we're seeing so far. And we're also seeing the tax revenue generated. A lot of money is going into education. And um, it's, it's working very well in Colorado. I think Colorado is very much, uh, very much a, a model state. How much tax revenue has Colorado generated? Do you know? From, uh, I, don't have the, I don't have the numbers in, in front of me, but it's very easy to, to, um, to look that up. Well, and I hear what you're saying, but at the end of the day also, um, marijuana is a drug. I mean, it is a chemical substance that people can become addicted to. And I know we're sitting here talking about the debates of, of legalization and decriminalization and the costs that the cost benefit of that. But there is a cost to addiction, isn't there? There are social costs. Yes, there's, there's health care costs. There's costs with, uh, you know, treatment, drug treatment and things like that. We're going to be paying those costs, whether it's legal or not. Um, and you, we have to look at, you know, marijuana. And this is something that Ethan Nadelman with the Drug Policy Alliance, what he refers to as marijuana exceptionalism. Uh, a lot of people with, with the, in the legalization movement, I mean, they're against the, the, you know, the war on drugs altogether. But I, I, I look specifically at, at marijuana, and it's different as far as, you know, you say it's addictive. It's really not physically addictive. Um, for some people, it is psychologically addictive. Um, and, you know, as far as intoxication, um, it, it, does, it does get you intoxicated, uh, but it's very different than alcohol because it doesn't act on, you know, slowing down your central nervous system the way alcohol would and, or um, other drugs like opioids. Um, it acts on the endocannabinoid system that, that's in your body, in your brain, and in your, in your organs and affects you very, diff very differently. So it's not something that's toxic. It's not something you can overdose on. It's not something that, that's going to kill somebody because they, they took too much. Like with alcohol, you know, you, you take 13 shots in an hour, you can die, and people people die that way. Marijuana, there, there's no issue there. There's there's nothing like that, and you know the medical benefits are, are very very clear. So we look at it as you know something that's obviously clearly less harmful to our bodies than alcohol. Why? And it's a natural plant, you know that that, that grows on the earth. Why is this illegal? Why are we criminalizing pe people for this, especially responsible adults who use it responsibly? And I encourage everybody to um, look at the 
and watch the testimony and, and listen to uh, this discussion because a, lo a lot of these things were talked about in much more detail than you know I'd be able to go into. Chris, I, I want to get your take on that because as a practitioner, I'm sure you've seen a lot of clients who have suffered from addiction and you know firsthand that our courts really struggle with addressing the addiction problem. And whether it's marijuana, whether it's alcohol, uh, our courts are not properly set up to really handle those issues, are they? No, they're, they're kind of the, the avenue of last resort. Uh, the courts oftentimes inherit uh, the problems of people who, who can't afford uh, to uh, attend a, a structured rehab program. Uh, what we've learned many times is that a structured rehab program uh, requires a great deal of time and oftentimes has to be coupled with uh, psychotherapy. And, and unfortunately, the folks who end up in our criminal justice system most times can't afford that. And so their idea of withdrawal, regrettably, is oftentimes confinement or confinement in a, in a treatment program. Uh, but very rarely is there any, it, we do not have meaningful, structured psychotherapy following that up. I want to take a, take a little break here because we got our first phone call of the night. So I want to go turn to that. Hello, welcome to HC Sailor Reasonable Doubt. Hello, great topic. Do you think the president will go down as the worst uh, drug warrior? Because when he made Vicodin Schedule 2, that means that you have to give your analysis to get your uh, prescription. That means marijuana people are excluded. Even cancer said you got a month to live. They will tell it to your face or over on the phone that, uh, no, we don't have anything for you. No, wait a second. You've got treatments that are non-narcotics. Oh. Well, how about some, you know, it seems the ruling class have lost their minds. I understand they can wait months for back or the executive jet. They don't want the guy wiping the, the bugs off the, the windshield to be on a box. And, and they've, uh, they've just really lost it. And, uh, can you speak to that, Mr. Miller? It's a great show. Sure, thank you. Uh, Jason, I think he's, what he's getting at probably is, is for what we could get at the phone call. I think there's some issues with the uh, dispensaries and medical marijuana and, and a backlog of people having problems getting that. That's, that seemed to be the issue I was, uh, I was understanding. And I've heard some, uh, some issues with that. I know we've had a lot of problems with the medical marijuana dispensaries and how those people are treated, how people who are waiting to get those and get a, get a valid prescription for those. Can you talk a little bit and try to answer that caller's questions as best you can? Yes, um, I did. It's, with the dispensaries, you know, the industry, the industry regulations and, and the regulatory framework, it, it varies state to state to state, and there's you know certain costs involved with with getting um, licenses and and things like that to open dispensaries. And one of the biggest problems we see is them not being able to do business with banks because you know the the fed, the feds are, are threatening the banks if they do business with with these dispensaries, so they're having to deal with cash. That's about the biggest problem that that uh, that we've seen. But there's there's solutions are, are coming up for that. You know, like credit unions and things like that are are coming into place and and taking care of some of those problems. And the way I look at it, you know, if you just let you know the let let the market work, uh, it, it, those these the private sector will work those things out. You know, it, it, those things will come up and, and problems will get solved in a productive way with people voluntarily uh, interacting with each other. And, you know, when the government steps out of the way and lets that happen, we're going to see um, a, lot of, a lot of job growth uh, in areas where that takes place. Uh, Chris, so if, if we were to legalize marijuana in Texas, only in Texas, not decriminalized, but legalized, how would somebody be impacted who sells marijuana, who, who grows it and sells it as, as a business? I, I guess if I understand you correctly, you talk about the fellows who are doing it illegally now. No, I mean, so if I if Texas now decriminalizes marijuana, so that is completely legal. It's, it's not decriminalized. I'm sorry. It's it's now legal. If I go into the business of selling marijuana, what kind of liability would I face as, as a seller of ma uh, marijuana in Texas, even though now it is legal? Is there, is there a criminal liability for me selling it? I mean, if we legalize the recreational amount and I now sell marijuana to people, what liability do I face for that? Well, I guess it, it, under the, the present uh, bill, if we just knock it down to some civil penalty, that doesn't address the delivery issue. Right. If, if marijuana, uh, so it would still be criminal. If, however, uh, marijuana was legalized on the order of what we see in Colorado, uh, 
uh, then that would change the dynamic entirely. I guess it would probably fall under a licensing issue, and that is whether or not you had a license to grow and to sell uh, in order to control the the, the quality of the product and, and uh, well, provide some assurances and quality control for the consumer. Um, uh, there may be some small exceptions for personal use, uh, but aside from that, I think you'd, you'd have to have a proper license. I want to remind everybody we're about halfway through the show right now. We are taking your calls. We'll have the number at the bottom of your screen. We're also taking questions via Twitter at HCCLA underscore TV, so please send us your questions. Uh, for us uh, at, on Twitter tonight. And Jason and Chris will try to answer as best we can. Um, guys, I want to talk and kind of move into another segment, and that is the synthetic drugs. And there's been a lot of uh, literature lately, a lot of bad press uh, about bath salts, uh, synthetic marijuanas, um, Kush, Space Cadet, some of these others that are out there. And um, Carmen asked the question, are synthetic drugs more dangerous than their normal street counterparts? What's the answer to that, Chris? Absolutely, yes. And why is that? Uh, there is absolutely no predictability to the uh, substance that you're consuming. Uh, I'm somewhat familiar with the manufacturing process of synthetic drugs. Uh, if you can imagine a conveyor belt going through a warehouse with a various substances and plants on that conveyor belt uh, being sprayed by a bunch of fellas uh, wearing uh, two-bit uh, insecticide suits and, and masks, uh, spraying whatever substance bottles they're given, you, you've got basically the synthetic market. It is a horrible market. In my opinion, it's the equivalent of uh, huffing paint. Now, are those drugs prosecuted any more harshly than, say, pure cocaine or pure meth or, or regular marijuana? I mean, are, those, are the synthetic drugs prosecuted on, on a heavier standard? No. Uh, I will say synthetic drugs are treated more seriously under the penal code than marijuana. Uh, they're what we call Schedule 2A uh, substances. However, they're not considered uh, on the same par as heroin or cocaine, a penalty group one controlled substance. In my experience, prosecutors tend to tr uh, treat synthetic marijuana similarly to larger quantities of, of real marijuana. Uh, personally, I think that they're not paying much attention to the uh, incredibly horrible effects of synthetic uh, substances. And, and Jason, how has the rise in th synthetic drugs made it more difficult for your organization in, in, it, in its efforts to try and legalize or decriminalize marijuana? Well, when it comes to the, the term synthetic marijuana, to me, that term doesn't even really make a lot of sense because what we're commonly hearing referred to as synthetic marijuana is not marijuana at all. Um, what they do is they'll take, it's not THC, it's not a synth synthetic THC is something like Marinol, which is FDA approved, which is a, a THC pill that's 100% THC. That's synthetic marijuana, technically. Um, what we're seeing with these, these street um, synth synthetic cannabinoids is basically they're, they're taking the, the molecular structure of something like THC, something that will get you high similar to marijuana, and they're altering it a little bit. So it's, it's a little bit off. And what they're doing is they're making a chemical out of it, and then they'll take some plant substance like, like lemongrass or something like that, and they'll spray this chemical onto the plant substance, and they'll sell it as incense, and they'll say it's not for human consumption, it, it, it's incense, it's burns, it's, it's for the aroma. And um, the marketing t strategies that they use is very misleading because people buy it and they smoke it. And the reason why this happens, it's, it's a result of prohibition. When you're prohibiting the natural products that people want, that people desire, that you know, the market demands for, uh, you prohibit that, uh, then that's, this is a result of, of that happening directly. And a lot of times what people will do, and a lot of young people, is if they get in trouble for marijuana and they're, having, or they're on probation or they're taking drug tests, uh, they still they still want to want to use marijuana. So, to avoid uh, having a, a bad drug test, what they'll do is is they'll use the the syn synthetic version, thinking it's similar. They'll think it's the same because it, it's, it's they don't understand it. And we see a lot of terrible things, you know, terrible things happen to people, and it's um it's really a, because of prohibition. Now, Chris, there's also out there analog drugs and those are a little bit different than synthetic drugs a lot of people get them confused so what's the difference between analog drugs and synthetic drugs i think analog drugs are drugs that are chemically uh, uh, 
chemically analogous to the actual drug. In other words, they're so tightly chemically related that they fall under the analog statute. Synthetic drugs, candidly, it's nothing but a marketing ploy. Uh, they're calling it synthetic marijuana because they want to piggyback on the image of marijuana, but it bears very little in the way of chemical, chemically similar structure. And what is there, we talked about the analog drugs and some of the, the synthetic drugs being on Schedule 2. What are analog drugs? What do they fall under? Well, analog drugs piggyback uh, on the substance that they're actually trying to mimic. And so uh, the, it, it tailors, uh, or, or it, I should say the punishment range is tailored to the drug it's trying to analogize itself to. And which, in, in your mind, is, the, is there a difference in the danger level between synthetic drugs and analog drugs? In other words, the analog drugs, are, are they less dangerous than the synthetic drugs? I don't know if you can truly generalize a sense of dangerousness. Uh, I will say that it's been my experience that with these synthetic drugs, uh, the uh, experiences uh, or anecdotal experiences that I've had, they tend to, to re produce much more dangerous and terrible outcomes. Uh, I've had several clients end up in hospitals over synthetic drugs. As far as analogs go, I think you have to go back to the danger of the underlying substance you're attending to mimic. I mean, there's nothing terribly safe about, you know, sure. using heroin. Yeah, exactly. Well, well Chris, it, it sounds to me like the, the problem with synthetic drugs is a quality control issue. Is that is that the, the reason why they are more dangerous, in that you don't know what you're spraying and the amount you're spraying? Or is that the issue? That's certainly part of it. There's no doubt that uh, when it comes to synthetic drugs that the, uh, that the unpredictability of the drug is a huge problem. The other issue is the intensity of the drug. Uh, we've seen such variability among the chemicals that I've seen things that, uh, you know, you know studies, uh, chemical studies that say this will produce an effect 1,600 times more intense than marijuana in some capacity. I don't exactly know how we forensically quantify that and come up with that number, uh, but it bears very little similarity to marijuana. I think, in my opinion, the analogy is it, it truly is, as opposed to huffing paint, it's like smoking paint. You're going to get a, an effect. We can't predict what it'll be. All right. Now, we heard some talk, we've heard some talk about these substances called shatter. Yes. Uh, can you explain what that is? Yeah, shatter is starting to appear in Texas and in, in, in Houston in particular. Uh, uh, when in the, in the Colorado markets, we're seeing the production of, of various waxes and, and uh, THC is being uh, distilled in, in purer and purer forms. In its purest form lately, uh, it's called shatter and, and called that because the final production of the product, it, it actually shatters. It's used, in my understanding, in, in vapor cigarettes, and it produces a very intense high because the person is consuming uh, very, very concentrated THC. Um, it is uh, very attractive in the, in the, in the streets as a, as a marketed product because it's easy to transport, it's easy to sell, and it's very expensive. Now, is that actual THC, is, is it a synthetic or is it an actual THC that's, that's somehow made more potent? It is an actual THC that's derived from the resin of the plant. Gotcha. So uh, my next question to you, Jason, as, as, as um, the executive director of Normal, with stuff like that, there are those out there who would argue that marijuana itself, it's always been the argument that it's a gateway drug. Why would you sit here and argue that by legalizing it, we aren't leading to something to, to worse use of something like shatter? Well, with those products, uh, you know, the dabs or, or the wax, the, the more concentrated forms, there is, I, I like to caution, you know, I like to, to look at this on, on, the, on the side of caution because there is some political backlash that, that can come from that because people see that and, and they, they look at it and it, it's kind of, it's, it's a little bit scary, scary for them. Um, you know, T THC is not something that, that can kill you. So it's not like, it's not like meth or, or some of these other um, products that are, that are chemically manufactured. Um, in, in Colorado, I, I think that's why it's important to have, you know, consumer protections in place. Uh, consumer protections against things like, um, you know, checking for impurities and checking for um, pesticides and molds and, and things. So we're seeing the market work that out in places like Colorado, where there are strict uh, regulations in terms of even the temperature that you have when you have edibles and, and you have some of these other uh, newer products that are coming out, even the temperature that you have to keep it at, 
is uh, is regulated. So um, I think you know regulation can be a solution to um, you know address uh, issues like that. Um, and as far as the, you know the gateway theory, this was something that uh, Dr. Bill Martin actually talked about in terms of. Um, People saying it's a gateway into other drugs. I mean, that's something that's been been so much debated. But all, all the research has shown that it's not necessarily the uh, the drug itself that we need to look at. It's more the person who who may be um, other situations, economic situations, family, you know, social situations like that that could affect somebody going on to use harder substances. Most people who use marijuana do not go on to harder substances. And we also heard testimony from people that have been through traumatic experience, you know, veteran, veterans um, served in the military and have been through some very traumatic experiences and have had problems with alcoholism and, and addiction to pills as a result of PTSD and things like that. And some have said, you know, well, well marijuana was an exit drug for me. You know, it was not a gateway. It's, the, it's having the opposite effect for, for some of those people, especially for our veterans. Well, I want to circle back to one thing Chris said about Shatter, and that is that a lot of this is being made in places like Colorado, where, there, where we've got full legalization. So they're able to extract this from the plant. There's really no checks on it um, because it's fully legalized. So what, what regulations have, has Normal been proposing in Colorado and other states to really try and, and put a clamp down on stuff like this? You know, that's not something that I have uh, a lot of knowledge about being, you know, working in Texas and working on the, the Texas uh, state level issues. That's more a question for somebody at the national level or somebody in Colorado or, or somewhere like that. Okay. Um, Chris, is, is, are these synthetic drugs and analog drugs and things like Shatter, are they replacing and becoming the, the new trendy drugs, so to speak, here in, in Houston and other major cities? Are they replacing heroin and cocaine as, as the trendy drugs? I don't know if replacing is the right word. Um, we have seen a growth in, in Houston of drugs uh, that have become, for lack of a better word, trendier. Uh, I can say this. Ten years ago, uh, there wasn't a heroin case that walked through my door. Now, it walks through my door about once a month. Uh, when I started as a prosecutor at the district attorney's office in 1993 until I left in 98, I prosecuted one DWI where a person consumed a pill. Uh, now, uh, I'd say it's probably part of one out of, and this is I'm guessing based on my personal experience, one out of every seven DWIs in, in my practice. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we're, we're seeing uh, focused uh, continuing legal education seminars on DWIs that are pill and drug based. Uh, I never saw a meth case come through my office until about four years ago. Now I'm seeing it all the time. PCP, I'm seeing it constantly. Uh, and, and I'm seeing them in focused communities. For example, I'm seeing PCP very focused among young black males. And, and it's a, uh, it's, it's a very strange outgrowth. I'm not quite sure I know what's triggered this sudden spread of all these hardcore drugs, um, but it's there, and, and it's something that needs to be addressed. Well, and, and recently, too, it was very easy because meth, people could make that by basically extracting out of Sudafed, mm -hmm. uh, and that caused the rise in pushing some of these drugs like Sudafed to where you actually had to go take a card to get it from the pharmacist. Um, so, you know... I guess you see that trend, but it hasn't stopped it, has it? I mean, it's, it, we, we put in a check like that, but it hasn't prevented people from getting those those drugs in order to go home and make home-based meth, has it? No, I mean, methamphetamine is, is, an, is an unusual drug because if you have access to the feedstock ingredients, it is so cheap to make that it is enormously profitable in the illicit market. And uh, I'm confident uh, that it is, a, it is a very popular cartel drug because of that. When you say profitable, is it because the materials are so cheap or is the, 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 the spread between the materials and the cost? I mean, what's the cost of it right now going for? I'm not quite sure I know what a kilo of, of uh, methamphetamine goes for presently. I, I don't have any reliable numbers on that. I do know that the cost to produce it is among the cheapest of all the hardcore drugs. And, uh, Jason, I kind of want to come back to you a little bit because being normal, you guys are focused on the legalization of marijuana, obviously. 
but what steps do you guys take in order to, I guess, ensure that the transition of some of this stuff is done in a safe way and that the, and that the community is being protected? Well, I think that first and foremost, uh, medical marijuana, uh, we need to have safe and legal access for patients in Texas. Uh, I think patients should come first. There's a lot of um, efforts on a comprehensive medical marijuana bill, and that's House Bill 3785, which also has a companion bill in the Senate, and that was introduced by um, Representative Marquez, and that's a very comprehensive bill. It's a whole plant bill, so you can use the whole plant. It, it can treat um, people with uh, who, who really need it, who have debilitating conditions, a qualifying condition. And that's something that uh, is, is, is having a big push right now. And then the, the decriminalization of small amounts is, is the other issue where th there's a big push for that. And um, th those are things that are going to be steps toward um, getting away from prohibition. And, and what we're seeing is, you know, the people who, who are against these measures, they're just on, they're on the wrong side of history. And more and more people are realizing that, and, and the opposition is is becoming less as more states are going this direction, and it's just gonna the momentum is gonna continue. What we've seen here in Texas and Houston and, and all across the state is a, a huge influx of interest in this issue, of interest in the activism and and reforming the laws because of things that have happened in other states and because of um, the activism, you know, growing uh, and the interest growing so much. And Chris, I want to circle back to something you said earlier. We were talking about marijuana and cops using marijuana as a gateway to other investigations. If marijuana is legalized, how does that help or hinder uh, law enforcement in other investigations for other more dangerous crimes? I, I think it, it absolutely hinders a, a police investigation. Right now, uh, I don't think there's any secret. Uh, the number one way to search a car is to claim that you smelled the odor of marijuana. Uh, I, I think I read that about three times a day on every offense report. The officer stopped you on speeding. He walked up to the car. The minute he says he smells marijuana, he gets to open you up, get you out of the car, pat you down. He gets to look in the car, take as much time as, as, it, as it takes him. He can look in every spot where you might have marijuana. Now, you take away uh, that issue and say, okay, we're going to make marijuana legal. Well, you just gutted his ability to search that car. Well, we gutted his ability to search it illegally, I guess, or under false pretenses, maybe. Well, yeah. So is that a, a valid argument for the, to keep marijuana legal, uh, Ill illegal, and that you will hamper or hinder law enforcement in the, in the application or, or investigation of other crimes? Um, no, I, I don't think that you keep marijuana illegal in order to advance uh, criminal investigations. I, I think that that'd be a little disingenuous. I think that that would be basically uh, encouraging officers to use pretextual stops. So that doesn't make that, that that's not a, a valid argument. Right. Chris, we got a question coming on Twitter, kind of going back to your PCP. Uh, comment from earlier, and, and one of our viewers wants to know what's more expensive, PCP or crack, if you know. Well, it depends, I guess, on how how it's it's sold. The bottom line is, for single use, they're the same price. Uh, one rock of crack cocaine is about ten dollars, and if you want to dip your your uh, joint in a bottle of PCP, it's ten dollars. So for that single use, it's probably about the same. But if you if you took it out and you said a large amount of PCP versus a larger amount of, of crack, I think PCP is going to get a lot more expensive. And Jason, we, uh, Carmen mentioned this earlier. She talked about powdered alcohol or palcohol. Uh, it's something new. It hasn't hit Texas yet. It is what it sounds like, powdered alcohol. Uh, in your opinion, do you think powdered alcohol is still an alcohol, even though it's a powder, or is it more like a drug and should be enforced more as a drug? Uh, well, powdered alcohol... It, 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 I don't know a whole lot about it, but from what I know, it's, it's powder that you mix with alcohol, and there's, cons, there's these concerns that people have about it that are really weird, like people are going to snort it or something. And for a shot, you know, about a shot's worth of alcohol, it's, it's like this much powder. It's like, it's like a ton of powder that you would not be able to physically actually like snort to get even one shot worth of alcohol in your system. So a lot of these concerns that people have are just so unfounded that uh, they, they, they border on you know, ridiculous. But as far as the chemical makeup, if it's alcohol or something else, I, I really don't know um, as far as that. But I want to go back to the point about hindering law enforcement. 
because you know the way I see it is that it hinders law enforcement from being able to investigate us or arrest us for marijuana. But I, I don't really see how it hinders their ability when it comes to you know vi- violence and, and things like that. As far as the searching, you know, claiming they smell you know the aroma of this plant, and then we lose our Fourth Amendment. That's what we're seeing a lot of times, unfortunately, is people can be searched, their cars, their bo- even inside their bodies because of the claim of, of, of smelling this plant. So I think, you know, from a Fourth Amendment perspective, um, h- hindering law enforcement just seems kind of like, like you said, you know, disingenuous. I, I would agree with that. So, are you, or Jason, are you saying that by legalizing marijuana or at least decriminalizing it, in a way you're kind of backdoor enforcing our Fourth Amendment rights? Is, is that the kind of argument you're making? Well, they're using a plant as an excuse to skirt the Fourth Amendment. So, I mean, that would be the reverse of that, but, but yes. I'm going to go back to alcohol, the powdered alcohol for a second. Because I, stuff. Well, I find this really ironic, and, and, and I don't know if anybody else does, but in March, the feds say it's okay. Go ahead, sell it. Go for it. And now the states are the ones trying to ban it, exactly opposite of what's happening with marijuana where the states have legalized it, and the feds, to some degree, if you talk to those in DEA, the agents and everybody else, other than the Holder administration and the people within the, the Justice Department, there's a real conflict here. I mean, it, 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 it's alcohol. I mean, well, I guess that's the first question I have for you, Chris, is powdered alcohol plus water, is that really an alcoholic beverage? And <laughs> it sounds like it is. And, and I, if I mean, so, why, as why, it's combined. why should it be legal under state law, particularly if the feds have blessed it? I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I, I'm not terribly familiar with how the substance can be manipulated. So I don't know if there's some growing health and safety concern. I will say that I'm sure that if it's in powder form, somebody's going to snort it. Well, and that's, but that's one of the concerns. It'll have. <laughs> well, that's one of the concerns that the legislature have said. Some of these senators go out and said, we're afraid they're going to snort this stuff. The kids are going to snort it. Kids are going to sneak it into high school football games or whatever, that that's the public concern to do it. But, I mean, couldn't they just as easily go, go down and get the the travel, you know, alcoholic bottles that you get from airplanes and, and sneak well, those sure. in? Flights. Oh, sure. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing these drugs develop in, in remarkably creative forms. For example, uh, THC gummy bears. Yeah. You know, we have gummy bears that are infused with THC. That will pass through every single uh, airport checkpoint. You can carry them into schools. You can you probably get past a canine search with them. And uh, that raises all a whole bundle of other search issues uh, and, and enforcement issues. Um, and, and I look at this question about powdered alcohol and the potential abuses, and I think you have to say, well, we, you know, how, what are we going to do about this? Are we going to accept it and accept the inevitable consequences and creativity that comes with it or not? Yeah. I, you know, Chris, another use of powdered alcohol, which is what I imagine I would use it for, is taking the alcoholic drink and putting more alcohol in it with powdered alcohol. So now I've got a double. Uh, is, is that by itself something dangerous, in your opinion, to be concerned or is, is that an issue with that powdered alcohol as well? Well, I guess uh, a lot depends on, on how people are going to choose to abuse the product. And, and that's obviously where the law steps in, is, is when these substances can be easily abused or easily manipulated or put into dangerous circumstances. For example, let's suppose it's a concentrated product and you can snort it. Uh, then it becomes, uh, uh, if it becomes fashionable for kids to do it, uh, we see limitations on it. We saw the same thing with uh, the dust spray. You know, kids started huffing dust spray. A couple kids ended up in a, in a hospital. Immediately we saw some restrictions in, in educational uh, uh, effects. I would imagine we're going to see the same thing with powdered alcohol. Yeah. Well, so, so, Chris, you said something. You said the ability to use and abuse it. The fact that something can be easily abused or easily misused, is that enough? And I mean easily, not just that it can be abused or misused, but easily abused or misused. Is that enough for the government to limit its, its availability to the general public? And the same thing for you, Jason. I, I will say this. That, that's a public policy question, right? And that is, where, when does the government step in? When, when do you start legislating? Do we rely upon a person's uh, self-determination? 
and their ability to self-regulate, or do we pass laws? We have laws that say you've got to use seatbelts. I remember the debate in Massachusetts that you, that was an absurd infringement on our personal freedoms. Uh, however, now Massachusetts has a seatbelt law. Um, you know, we didn't trust that people were going to use seatbelts. We decided that the, that the, the uh, statistics justified their, their importance. Same thing with helmet laws. And I think if you look at it in the negative, do we prohibit people from using it if they're easily abused? Question is going to be a function of outcome. And that is, uh, we're going to watch the statistics, see how it develops. And if it's ugly, yeah, we'll see legislation. We got one more call coming in. I want to get to that. Hello, welcome to HCC Reasonable Doubt. Uh, yes, I heard you all talking about strong marijuana, and I heard a, a, was a professor of pharmacology from MD Anderson Cancer Center, his name was Alan Robson. He said they have studied marijuana and there is no lethal dose for THC and all. Hang up on this thing. Thanks. Yeah, and that's kind of what we touched on before. I mean, you were, you were talking about the fact that that uh, your research shows that it's very hard to get to the point where consuming THC is going to really cause you to to die. Uh, and and I I think the literature is pretty clear on that. But it but it is a more potent form that we were talking about. It's a it's a more potent strain, as you've said. Um, that whether it's addictive or not, I guess is the is the ultimate question. Whether it causes addiction issues, I think was was more of, of what we're getting at. Well, with that, I would say that um, when it comes to young people, you know, be having addiction problems in their adult life, later in life, um, I would think that as a young person, and, and I know this, you know, from experience and people I know who are close friends, that uh, abu using alcohol, tobacco, or marijuana, or other drugs at a very young age, age in the teenage years, you know, you're going to be more likely to have uh, problems with addiction later in life. And what, what I would say you know, to those young people is, you know, abstain from all three, abstain from alcohol use, abstain from tobacco and marijuana, all three. You know, when you're 18 or 21 years old, you can make a responsible decision. And I think that that would curb a lot of, a lot of addiction is, uh, problems is, is the education and, and really um, pushing that education aspect of it. Well, Jason, we, you, you mentioned several times that marijuana and THC is not deadly. Now, at what levels does it become dangerous to the body, if any? I am, that's a, diff, that's, that's a good question. That, that's, that's a difficult question. I think that uh, people react to it differently and um, that's more of a, more of a scientific, a little, too, little bit too scientific for, for me. All right. We got one question, one final question, because we only got a few, uh, we got about 30 seconds left here on the show. And so I want to get this last question and that's, it, Twitter follower says, powdered alcohol may be coming to Texas. Is it any different than gummy bears with THC? I think the jury is still out on that. We don't really have enough research on the powdered alcohol yet, do we? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think we have to see how this, this comes forward in the marketplace. How does it start to uh, distribute itself? Uh, what age groups is it attracted to? What, you know, bottom line is you, you don't know how it's abused until it gets out into the marketplace and people get their hands on it. Well, and we should be clear too, it hasn't been uh, deemed illegal in Texas yet. So powdered alcohol may, in fact, hit the shelves here. This is not, it's not available yet. Right, it's just not available yet. So I think that's the thing we want to make clear. But um, that's all the time we have for tonight. So I want to start my wrap-up now and, and uh, thank Jason Miller and Chris Downey for being our guests tonight. Guys, it was a great conversation. I appreciate you both coming on. Uh, Jason, I really hope you'll stay in touch with us and let us know all the legislative efforts going on in Austin. Sure, absolutely. And uh, Chris, hope you'll be back another time to discuss some more Anytime. issues. Damon, good to, good to be back and talking news and legal issues again with you this week. Welcome back. Thank you very much. We'll do it all again next week. We thank you for joining us for another episode and look forward to having you next week. Please follow us on Twitter at HCCLA underscore TV and like us on Facebook. We'll see you next week. Good night.